The future is coming. Make it brighter with Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easy to turn your idea into a unique website. Showcase your work, blog, or publish content. Even sell products and services in just a few clicks. Customize everything from look and feel to settings and products. With beautiful templates created by world-class designers. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade, ever. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code GRAMMAR to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a meaty middle about idioms that use the word pull, a tidbit about foods that get their names from the pan in which they're cooked, and a follow-up about dilly-dilly and dilly-dally. We'll start with pull idioms because some of these will surprise you. An idiom is an expression whose meaning can't be understood literally just by looking at the words that make it up. For example, if you take the cake, you're not stealing pastry. You're good at something. If you're sharp as a tack, you don't have fingers like Edward Scissorhands, you're really smart. You can tell pretty easily how some idioms got started. Moving the goalposts, for example, is an expression borrowed from football. Giving the one-two punch came from boxing. It's a lot less clear where other idioms came from, though. Let's look at a few that start with the word pull, and you'll see what I mean. First, there's to pull the plug on something. This means to end something, often abruptly. For example, you might pull the plug on your son's sleepover if you learned he and his friends were TPing the neighbor's yard. This expression sounds like it refers to pulling an electrical plug from its socket, but that's not the origin of the idiom. Instead, it refers to how you flush an old-fashioned toilet by pulling out a stopper which empties the bowl into the pipes below. This used to be a pretty remarkable act. A 1932 book describes how a character, quote, pulled the plug of the water closet and turned to us with a triumphant smile as the house echoed with the demonstrably efficient deluge, unquote. If only we got that excited about flushing the toilet these days. Next, there's pulling out all the stops. This means to do everything you possibly can to make something happen. For example, if you pulled out all the stops to get to your friend's birthday party on time, you might have sprinted the last mile to her home after your car broke down. This expression refers to an activity most of us have never done, playing a pipe organ. An organ is like an overgrown pan flute. It produces sound by pumping wind into pipes of different lengths. The bottom of each pipe is covered with a wooden stop, or seal. The organist pushes the stop over the bottom of the pipe to silence it and pulls it away to bring the pipe into play. Thus, to create maximum volume, organists pull out all the stops. They let the full measure of wind flow into each of the organ's pipes. Organs are complex instruments, but rudimentary versions were built way back in the 3rd century B.C., The first recorded use of this idiom, however, wasn't until 1865 in a book of essays. Then there's pulling one's weight. This idiom also refers to something most of us have never done, crewing. That's a sport in which several rowers work together to propel a boat across the water using oars. There's sweep-style crewing, where each rower pulls one oar with both hands, There's also skull-style crewing, where each rower holds two oars, one in each hand. Either way, to win a race, all rowers must literally pull their own weight as they drag the oars against the water, pushing the boat forward. Thus, pulling your own weight came to mean doing your share of the work, rather than being a drag on your teammates. This expression was first seen in written use in 1921 in a British weekly. Finally, there's pulling the wool over one's eyes. This means to trick someone, as in, I thought our company was doing well until I showed up for work and saw a closed sign on the door. The manager really pulled the wool over our eyes. You might think that this expression has to do with woolen caps. You'd be close. The wool in this phrase comes from woolen wigs, the kind worn by noblemen in 16th and 17th century Europe. 
In fact, wigs have been worn since the earliest recorded times. The ancient Egyptians shaved their heads and wore wigs as protection from the sun. The ancient Greeks and Romans did the same, and they used wool from cows, goats, yak, sheep, even horses to make them. Wigs really took off in the 17th century, when King Louis XIV of France started wearing one to cover his balding head. Aristocrats and courtiers took note and started wearing wigs themselves. Wigs soon became a symbol of social status, and styles eventually became so extreme that wigs often covered a man's back and shoulders and twisted in wide rolls down his chest. Servants were required to boil, curl, and powder these wigs, sometimes daily. And wigs became so tall and so expensive that men who were the biggest, puffiest ones were known as bigwigs. We still use that word today to mean an important person. It's easy to imagine one of these top-heavy wigs slipping over someone's eyes, blinding them temporarily. In that case, they'd be easy to fool, easy to trick. You can see from these examples that many idioms come from unusual or unexpected sources. That's what makes English so strange to learn and so fascinating to study. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Support for today's show comes from Squarespace. Are you ready to start your new business? Make it stand out with Squarespace. With beautiful templates created by world-class designers, Squarespace makes it easy to turn your idea into a new and unique website. Showcase your work, blog, or publish content. Even sell products and services of all kinds in just a few clicks. You can customize everything from look and feel to settings and products, and it's all optimized for mobile right out of the box. Use Squarespace's analytics to help you grow in real time. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Though, if you do have a question, Squarespace's award-winning 24-7 customer support is there to help. Destiny is calling, and it says you need a new website. Make it with Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code GRAMMAR to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com and the offer code GRAMMAR. Now, let's talk about dishes. I found a wonderful book at the library a few weeks ago called Word Mysteries and Histories, which was written in the 80s by the editors of the American Heritage Dictionaries. And as I was leafing through the book, I came across the kind of information I imagine you could only know if you spend most of your time looking at etymologies. The entry was for the word cauldron, which can be traced back to the late Latin word for kettle. But then it gets interesting because the word chowder also goes back to the late Latin word for kettle. Cauldron makes sense because it's kind of like a kettle, but chowder, while it still makes sense because you make chowder in a kettle, is more of a stretch. The fish stew gets its name from the pot you use to make it. And it turns out it's not the only food that gets its name from a pot or pan. The American Heritage editors write that lasagna comes from a Latin word for cooking pot, and casserole comes from a French word for saucepan. I tried to find more foods that got their names from the names of pots or pans and found only one, cassoulet. This is a French casserole made from white beans and meat, often pork, lamb, sausage, goose, or duck. The word comes from an Occitan word that means an earthenware dish. Occitan is a Romance language spoken in a few countries or regions, including the south of France, Monaco, Catalonia, and the Occitan valleys of Italy. As I said, I didn't find any other foods that got their names from pots and pans, but if you know of any, please leave a comment on this article at quickanddirtytips.com. I did find two other foods with interesting origins, though. First, tetrazzini. There are various recipes, but in general, a tetrazzini is a dish with a white sauce, maybe with mushrooms, served with cheese on top and over pasta. The only two I've ever tried are chicken tetrazzini and turkey tetrazzini, but people also make tuna tetrazzini. The dish is named after the Italian opera singer Luisa Tetrazzini, for whom it was first made. 
The most popular story is that it was invented by the chef at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, where Tetrazzini was a longtime resident. It's always tricky to know when to capitalize the names of foods that are derived from people or places, and it's usually best to check a dictionary or style guide. For example, the cocktail name Manhattan usually isn't capitalized, even though it's named after the city, but the cocktail called a Bellini, probably named after the painter, usually is capitalized. In most of the examples I found of the dish chicken tetrazzini, the word tetrazzini was capitalized. And finally, the word stew has an interesting and maybe a little disgusting origin. The food we call stew gets its name from the verb to stew, as in to take a bath. Meat cooking slowly in liquid comes from the idea of a person sitting in a hot bath. Hmm, ick. Thanks this week to Grammar Bursts and Crowdy123456 7, who left nice reviews at Apple Podcasts. Crowdy also asked a question about last week's episode that other people have asked too. How is the phrase dilly dally related to the word dilly? We talked about dilly dally last year in a podcast about reduplication. Bonnie Mills, who wrote that segment, said that dilly dally started with the word dally, which means delay. Then, people used reduplication, repeating words or parts of words to make new forms, to turn it into dilly-dally. Stop dilly-dallying means something like stop wasting time, stop delaying, or stop messing around. So it seems that dilly-dally isn't related to the carriage or coach meaning of the word dilly. Instead, it comes from dally, and the ad agency that came up with dilly-dilly was on to something. Dilly is just fun to say. So it showed up when people applied reduplication to dally. Other words formed from reduplication include shilly-shally and mumbo-jumbo. Also, I was curious which came first, dilly-dilly or dilly-dally. And it seems to be dilly-dally. It goes all the way back to 1741. Even after further searching beyond last week's episode, the oldest instance I could find of dilly-dilly was a nursery rhyme that likely originated around 1830. That nursery rhyme has four dillies in a row in each stanza. Here's how it begins. Oh, what have you got for dinner, Mrs. Bond? There's beef in the larder and ducks in the pond. Dilly, 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 come to be killed. For you must be stuffed and my customers filled. Again, at first it seems like dilly is just fun to say. Or it could mean something like hurry up. But Etymology Online says that dilly is also a nursery word for duck, so it seems most likely that Mrs. Bond or her companion are calling the ducks to come and be killed. One caveat about the dates is that the nursery rhyme could have been passed down orally for a long time before it was written down, so the 1830 date could be misleading. So that's the best answer I could find. It doesn't look like dilly-dally and dilly the carriage or dilly-dilly the interjection are related. And it looks like dilly-dally came first. Thanks for the question. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all my old podcasts and articles at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.